Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first Calm Tax Combo. Many of you have obviously joined us before in our Calm Combo series, which we started obviously about 12 months ago um, with all the COVID dramas and everything. But obviously, we thought time to move on the conversation. And obviously, a lot of what we talked about during COVID was tax, it wasn't just tax. But we thought the format worked really well to roll over um, the webinar series into our tax themes. So with me today, we, of course, when we're talking tax, we've got the Business Depot's Head of Tax, Jackie Reeves. Welcome, Jackie. Thanks, John. Excited to be here. Obviously, we're, we're kicking off our Calm Tax combos with a big discussion about the budget. So we're going to dive into the budget in our usual Calm COVID combo style of just getting down with a casual conversation answering any questions that you have along the way um, that we can answer, obviously, um, and just having a conversation about what was released in the budget last night. Of course, with me as always, Rebecca Mahalik from our Sydney office. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for having me again, John. It's nice to be talking about something a little bit different this time. It is, isn't it? Um, so the budget obviously was handed down last night. Um, it seems to be getting a positive response within the media, I suppose. It's a little bit like an Oprah budget in that pretty much everybody got something out of it, given it was very much a spending budget. Let's just dive into it. It wasn't too many like really big things from a tax perspective, but there's a couple of little gems in there that we need to just make sure everybody's across. And also what I want to do today is just give a bit of clarity about some of those things that we weren't quite sure whether they were going to go ahead or not. And obviously, if there was silence in the budget about them and they're already legislated, we assume they're going ahead. Um, or if they were mentioned in there, whether they were able to provide us with any more clarity. So um, we've got the detail of all of the summaries of the, of the budget on our blogs at businessdepot.com.au. So you could open those up. We've got one for the SME business owner. We've got one for real estate businesses. We've got one for superannuation and individuals. And we've got another one specifically around um, what the budgets did for women. Um, so let's start with the SME themed ladies, if you don't mind. And, and one of the things in there, Jackie, was the temporary full expensing of the assets. Give us a bit of a rundown. What did they announce last night? What is the real opportunity here for business owners? Yeah, so this is an extension on the temporary full expensing that they announced in the October budget. Um, for my mind, this is a, this is a good measure there because they've extended it for 12 months. Um, we never recommend businesses to run out and go and part, purchase big equipment just for the pure benefit of a tax tax deduction or an immediate tax deduction. But what this does for businesses who might have still been struggling a little bit with COVID recovery is it gives them another 12 months to, if business is picking up and they've got some big capital expenditure that they want to make, that they're going to be able to take, take advantage of the temporary full expensing. Um, good news is for businesses with turnover less than 50 million is that you can get um, immediate write-off for uh, secondhand assets is probably the big the big key there. I mean, this has been a big hero in their, in their COVID sort of tax plans, hasn't it? And um, I mean, Rebecca, are you seeing a lot of people actually using this? Absolutely, more than I expected, to be honest. I, I think for some of the industries that we work with in particular, they, they were hit quite hard at the beginning of COVID and have come out of it. And as cash flow has actually started to improve a bit, particularly from things like JobKeeper support, these businesses have made that decision to actually invest in the assets that maybe they put off for many years when cash flow was a bit tighter earlier on to continue to grow their businesses and bounce back. So they're taking advantage of this um, ability to expense the assets in full, absolutely to minimise tax. I suppose what it really does is it just aligns cash flow with tax, doesn't it? And, and that's all it's doing. It just means you're getting a tax deduction at the same time that you're cash flowing this. Of course, if you're actually financing the purchase of this asset, then you've even got a better position because you are creating a tax deduction from the purchase of it, but you do have to pay the finance off um, over the term of that finance. I don't know. I don't get too excited about this one, I suppose. And, and maybe that's because I do a lot with real estate agents and there's not a lot of equipment um, that they purchase. But for manufacturing and those types of businesses, I do think it is a great idea to be able to get that, that full expensing up front. There was another key initiative announced in budgets, um, in the COVID budget, let's call it, um, and that was the temporary loss carry back. Jackie, take us through that one and what that extension is about as well. 
Yes, I think it's probably tax practitioners. We didn't get too excited about that in October because we sat back and we went, well, we can't really apply it until we're preparing 30 June 2021 tax returns. Um, but what they've done there is they've extended it to align with the same date, so the temporary full expensing, that you now have the ability to carry back tax losses incurred up to 30 June 2023, and you can apply that to years as early as 30 June 2019. Um, and that's so the good thing about that is is that if you had some losses in in FY20 um, and some in FY21 that you can apply to FY19, is that there may be some businesses out there that could get a real um, hard cash tax refund um, for FY21. So some good things to be aware of when we're going to do some tax planning. I think it's a little bit confusing this one, isn't it? Because it's it's really you get a refund of tax paid in a previous yeah. year if you make a profit this year, is that right? Uh, if you've made a loss. You make a loss this year, but you made yeah. a profit in the previous year. Yeah, you've got to have had, made the profit in the previous year. Um, and, and look, there's some complexities with this, right? Because for corporates, we've always got to be careful around our franking account balances and that we're not creating, you know, franking deficit tax issues. Um, so I think it's, it's a good one that we should be engaging with clients on um, before the end of the year to see whether they can avail themselves of it. Um, the key thing with this measure is too, is it's for corporates only. So any of our businesses out there operating through trust structures, this measure is not going to be available as opposed to the temporary full expensing, which is anyone carrying on a business um, under the 5 billion turnover. And I think importantly to also note, if you made a loss in 2020, we can offset that against profits in 2019. So, um, but you can't claim that until we lodge your 2021 tax return. So we've got a bit to learn about the administration around this yet in that we haven't even seen the tax return yet, format yet as to how we would do this. Correct. <clears throat> now, there was a, a new terminology, I suppose, thrown around or new to the, to, I suppose, the market or the consumer generally, and that is around this concept of a patent box. Now, Jackie, I understand it's got very limited application at the moment, but what do you, explain to us this patent box, because I think it could be an interesting insight of, of future initiatives of the government. Yes, I'm, I'm actually quite excited by this, even though it has limited application to medical and biotech technologies at the moment, which is really probably trying to encourage, um, you know, we've seen with some of the vaccine rollout that Australia haven't been able to keep patents in Australia. Potentially that's what was driving it. Um, but basically, if you generate a patent or create a patent in Australia and you earn income from those patents um, by retaining that patent in Australia, you're going to get taxed at 17% on that income. So if you've got other income in your corporate structure um, other than patent income, it's going to be taxed at either 25 or 30%, but the actual patent income will be 70%. The devil's going to be in the detail in this one as to how it works, but I, I think it'll be akin to sort of an R&D offset. It'll, you'll only get taxed, you'll get a bit of a tax concession in your, in your tax return for it. Um, what I'm excited about is this is a positive step. It's a concession um, and the government has um, committed to starting to talk to the renewable energy, clean energy sector around expanding this into those areas. So rather than, you know, punishing businesses for what they seem to be as bad behaviours, like say, for example, a carbon tax, they're actually going to start talking about, you know, um, having a concession for innovative ideas around clean clean energy. So that's where I get excited about it. It's, it's, not, it's got small application at the minute, probably in the SME market, but that it has the capacity to expand. But it's a, it's a new initiative, which would be interesting to see whether they've rolled that out into other industries um, into the future. John, One I was going to say too, I, sorry, I was just going to say it's a change of thinking in the government for my mind too. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the other things in there is, and I suppose it's probably a bit of a sleeper, probably doesn't get a lot of coverage, but there's um, um, an increased ability to pause um, ATO collection of debts. Does this mean we've got, I don't know, does this mean we're, we, we're going to have less arguments with the ATO, Jackie, or what is this proposal that, they, that they've got in the budget? Yeah, so at the moment, if you've got a tax dispute with the ATO and they have put debt recovery action in place, like so you're going through an objection process, 
Um, to get a pause on that, you have to go through the full court system. It can obviously be a lengthy and costly um, system for taxpayers. So this announcement is, is pretty welcomed for SMEs. It's for businesses who are small business entities, so up to $10 million in turnover. And it means that they can put these requests through the AAT, which is a much simpler and faster process and hopefully tax effective. Um, what I would like to see is that we open this up for, for all businesses, to be honest, because... It's only small general, businesses at the moment, is it? It's only small businesses at the moment. Um, and what we're in at the moment is we're in a situation where we have a tax office who, who takes some positions, but realistically, until you're in the AAT or you're on the steps of the courthouse, the ATO, you know, they're the ones with the power being the regulator on the basis that burden of proof is the taxpayer. So I'd like to see um, if you want to go down an objection on a dispute that, that we could get some fast resolution for clients because you do quite often have to stump up some of the tax if you're in a dispute situation. So hopefully we don't have to worry about it for anybody, that one, but um, it's an, it sounds like it's an administrative um, efficiency gain that we've got there. Employee share schemes, there was a minor change with employee share schemes. Hard to get too excited about it, but just quickly, what do we need to know about that? Yeah, so basically it's, it's, a, it's a small tweak on employee share schemes if you um, cease employment with that employer that where you would have had a, a taxing point arise, um, even though you may not have been able to dispose of those shares, um, they're deferring the taxing point um, until you can you know, dispose of or forfeit those shares. So I, I guess that's a good tweak, but I, I really would have hoped to have seen some more in the employee share scheme space as employers coming out of COVID might be a little bit cash poor and they might want to, you know, to incentivise and retain employees that they could they could look at more employee share scheme options. There's still a fair bit of compute, confusion with employee share schemes. So it sounds like it's just tweaking one thing, um, which yep. is an improvement. Um, Self-assessing effective life for intangibles. So unlike plant and equipment, um, where you get depreciation, um, intangibles have got different rules. This is like patents, copyrights, in-house software those types of things. Um, Jackie, what's the proposal for anyone that's been investing in their intangibles? Yeah, so that you're going to be able to self-assess your effective life rather than use an ATO statutory method. Um, the important thing to note with this is it won't apply until I think 1 July 2023 until full temporary expensing um, measures expire. Um, but really good for anyone who's doing innovation R&D, investing in new technologies and, you know, new measures that they can, they can self-assess effective life. Because quite often those types of intangibles are unique to businesses and the people running the businesses have more, you know, industry insight as to what their actual effective life is. Okay. I want to then throw to some of the individual and, and family initiatives in there. I'll probably throw to you in a moment, Rebecca, if you don't mind with that. But um, if anyone does have any questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen there. Much easier for us to manage than the chat. Um, and by all means, don't hesitate to ask any question as we're going on the topics. Of course, low and middle income tax offset. Rebecca, what was announced about that? Um, so what they're providing with the low and middle income tax offset, so mouthful, isn't it, is a maximum offset of $1,000 for individuals earning, I think it's from about $45,000 up and $90,000. And for individuals with income of ninety dollars to $126,000, that offset will start to phase out once they're earning over $90,000. So this is, a, it's not really a lot of money, let's be perfectly honest, for individuals. It's, you know, a few dollars here and there for people who are very much in the middle and at that lower income end. It's not going to, in my mind, really impact enough people in a decent way. But it might put $1,000 more in, in some individuals' pockets, um, which it was due to finish on the 30th of June. So it's been carried over for another year um, through to 30 June 2022. So yeah, a, little bit, a little bit of a tax cut, I suppose. To continue. I think the decision to actually extend it out wasn't so much to provide a tax cut, but was to make sure that those people in the middle in Australia actually didn't receive a tax hike, which is what would have happened if they got rid of this. Okay. Um, childcare subsidies, Jackie, um, what were the, the big updates on, on childcare? Obviously, they're, they're throwing a bit more cash at that. 
Yeah, so at the moment, if you're um, high income earners over 186,000, I think is the test, um, you, there's a, a, a subsidy cap. They've removed that cap. So that means that you get a um, bit more benefit of the rebate. And if you have more than one child in um, childcare, your subsidy can um, go up to 95% for that second and subsequent child. So um, yeah, good. I mean, it's good news for, you know, families and it's good news, um, I think, to get some, you know, professionals back into the industry for not only female participation rates, but yeah, participation rates across the board. And I think we all know childcare is a, you know, it's a tough burden on, on working families. So I'd like to see more in that area, but that's a good start. Yeah, it sounds like it, it's, it's welcomed. Um, because we need people back in the workforce, don't we? I know one of the biggest complaints I'm hearing at the moment is that people can't get employees. I think someone said to me the other day in the manufacturing environment, they said they'll take anybody with a pulse. Um, so if you can give me someone with a pulse, we will take them. And then that's before you get to the hospitality and the agribusiness and so forth. So I see it as a good thing just to get people back um, into work. One of the other um, things in the budget last night, Jackie, if I can stay with you, is trying to get a little bit of clarity around residency so whether you're an Australian tax resident or an overseas tax resident just quickly what are they talking about there? Yes look we've got some pretty complex residency rules that you know go through you know resides test domicile test and then and then a day's test um, and what um, the there's been some board of tax recommendations and probably some pretty heavy lobbying from from industry to just make it simpler for people who I mean, COVID puts a bit of a pause on this stuff, but we do have a global environment where people do come in and out of Australia. So one of the recommendations is what they're calling a bright line test. Um, and that'll be the first pathway test that if you're in Australia, um, 183 days or more in a financial year, you will be an Australian resident, um, tax resident. So, I mean, there's always additional complexities around residency, but I think this is going to give us a little bit of clarity and some, some rules to work with within a framework. Yeah. When people come in and ask me to tell them whether they're a resident of Australia or not, and I say, well, there's four tests and there's all this case law we need to worry about, and obviously they don't understand the complexity in it. So to get some simplicity on that would be great. Rebecca, there was then a heap of things that were either confirmed or weren't spoken spoken about that were already legislated. What what's what's some of the ones we've got there, Rebecca? Uh, so the superannuation guarantee rate is increasing, which we've known about for quite some time. So from first of July, it's going from nine point five percent to ten percent. There was some talk about it being um, pushed out, and I know small business in particular, or actually all businesses in particular, would have liked to have not had to wear this burden from first of July. But uh, it's definitely coming in and. It's good for the people who are receiving it. Yeah, it'll be an interesting one though, because it'll, it, it, I remember when SGC was going up um, probably a decade ago or something or other, and when employees realised that they're on a package inclusive of super and they potentially could be getting less money in their pocket, um, their eyebrows raised. So it'll be in, there'll be some interesting discussions for employers. I know there's a few people on here from the real estate industry. So whether you've got your commission arrangements inclusive or exclusive of super is going to become um, important um, from it's July. It's really interesting because we've had a lot of those talks in the last couple of months with clients as we've sort of seen in some of their employment contracts. It's like, oh, you might want to talk to your employees. According to this, they're actually getting a pay cut on 1st of July. Yeah. <laughs> and see how that all works out. The other yeah. thing with superannuation, um, which was not something that's going ahead, but it was a new announcement, is that the minimum threshold of $450 a month um, is being abolished. So at the moment, uh, if you have employees that earn less than $450 a month, you don't have to pay super for them. That, that's going away and you'll be paying um, superannuation from employees earnings from dollar one. That would probably impact mostly your, your retail and hospitality industries that have a lot of casual employees, um, a lot of transient employees as well. My immediate reaction to that one, Rebecca, was uh, you know, 10% of $450 a month, no big deal. But what's your thoughts given you work so much in hospitality and 
those types of things. Yeah, look, it, it depends on the industry. Absolutely for the hospitality industry where there's lots of people who will do smaller shifts and the, the actual minimum wage is potentially not very high. You can have quite a few employees that consistently work below that amount, particularly when you've got um, uh, some backpacker employee situations as well, which I know aren't as common right now, but they will come in again. The other thing on this is the administration burden, which is dealt with mostly by our online accounting software software now there is still a portion of this here if you've got a lot of casual employees that's a lot more um, obtaining of superannuation details or setting them up in your default super funds chasing them up it's just a little bit more of a headache and definitely more of a cash outflow for particular industries of course the other thing that's already legislated that comes into play on the 1st of july 2021 is the reduction in the company tax rate so we're currently 26 percent and it goes down to 25% from 1 July. 1% neither here nor there, but it's come down from 30%. So that's over time been a, been a big difference for, for businesses that are trading through, through companies. That's for businesses with turnover less than $50 million. Um, so that will, will still go ahead. Jackie, the individual tax cuts have already been legislated, but they still probably feel a little bit, little bit far out what I think it's useful for people to know what we're working towards with our individual tax rates. Just quickly take us through those, if you don't mind. Yes, there's been a lot of conversation in recent years around what we're calling bracket creep, where some of the tax, because we work on a marginal tax system in the individual rates, but, you know, people earning more income, are, you know, losing the, losing the benefit of that because the, the brackets haven't, the percentage of the brackets haven't really changed. Um, so what this is doing is, basically removing the 37% tax rate um, from, I think, 45,000 up to 200,000 and giving a little bit more income in the in the higher tax threshold of 45% up to 200 to, to try to address some of the real concerns around bracket creep. Um, and I guess from a structuring percentage perspective is what this means is if you're earning up to 200,000, you're sort of at the 30% tax rate compared to a a corporate tax rate of um, of twenty five percent. So I guess that aligns it a little bit closer to the corporate tax rate. Obviously, it's a much simpler um, income tax position, isn't it? Um, by just having three levels within there, and by having that, that I think they say ninety five percent of taxpayers will be paying a marginal tax rate of thirty percent. Now, I think that's a good thing, that's especially right. in light of company tax rate being twenty five percent. And then I think there's less incentive to be um, moving things into company structures and so forth. Yeah. Unnecessarily, yeah. 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 Another sleeper that probably doesn't get a lot of attention, and Rebecca, you might tell us why, but the job maker hiring credit. Now, there was a lot of big deal made about this because it was to replace job keeper and job seeker and blah, blah, blah. Have you actually put any in place? I have assessed probably about 20 or 25 of them, and I've had one client with one employee be eligible for $100 a week. Yeah. The reason why there's not a big hoo-ha about this in the business environment is because it's not a big deal. It, the, the effort to claim it is almost negates any advantage you get out of it. It's very it's be hard to get excited about it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if we then um, flip over, and I want us to focus, because there were a few little initiatives in there around superannuation and specific to, to individuals. So we've got a separate blog on our website for those interested um, around the superannuation put together by Megan Kelly of our, of our team. And one of those announcements was around the work test. Who wants to volunteer to explain the work test and the changes? Rebecca, do you want to volunteer to do that one? <laughs> sure. Um... Hopefully Megan will be okay with everything I say right now. So um, the work test has been removed for super contributions for people aged between 67 and 74. So prior to this announcement and actually prior to this actually becoming um, legislation, uh, em, uh, employee, employees had to pass a work test or any individual had to pass a work test between 65 and um, and 75 to be able to contribute to superannuation. So now they're suggesting that this be um, abolished, um, but, but not for all contributions. It's only going to be for non-concessional contributions and for salary sacrifice arrangements. Um, if you are a self-employed individual wanting to make your own tax deductions into superannuation in your tax return, you're still gonna have to pass a work test to be able to do that in that age bracket. And so that's a really important differentiation there, isn't it? Because a concessional contribution for our audience are those contributions you get a tax deduction for. 
So you still have to be below 67 to get that as a deduction. You still have, you still have to be passing the work test if you're below 67 to get a deductible contribution. Yep. But you now have this ability up to 74 to put non-concessional contributions in, um, which basically just puts money out of one pocket into another without any tax benefit um, in doing so. And with the non-concessional contributions, um, they're actually looking at allowing people to also um, apply the bring forward rule. So you could potentially be able to actually contribute quite a lot of um, money into your superannuation, um, remembering that the um, there are caps in place generally for your balance of funds to still have concessional tax. So I think the current cap goes up, well, current cap's $100,000, goes up to 110000 on the 1st of July. If you can apply the bring forward rule, that would be three times that, so potentially 330 grand um, next year. They did talk a bit also about the downsizer contribution age as well. What's the downsizer, Rebecca? What, what do we need to know here? So the downsizer contribution is where if you are a homeowner and currently um, over the age of 65 and sell your family home, you can make a contribution out of those funds of up to $300,000 into superannuation. So the change that was announced yesterday is just around the age, which is reducing that from age 65 to age 60 to be able to contribute that $300,000 to super. Which will so do, you, do, you, do you reckon that'll have an impact, Rebecca, on, on I suppose, moving people... Um, at an earlier stage in life out of their house? Look, if people are downsizing a little bit earlier, which potentially they should be, then absolutely this is going to be a great advantage. You know, uh, my dad may or may not be happy with this, but I kind of wish this happened last year because we could have taken advantage of it then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Sydney is probably a prime location where that sort of stuff is um, uh, very appealing, isn't it? That's right. We then have the first home, uh, home super safe. First Home Saver Super Scheme. Now, this is the one where you can put personal contributions into superannuation, build it up within a superannuation environment, and then draw an amount out to put go towards um, purchase of your first home. So the threshold previously was $30,000, and they announced last night that that is going to increase to $50,000. So for any of those first home owners or first home buyers um, who are wanting to get into the market, that could be a good way for them to build their deposit up as well. Um, there's a few other things in there from a, from a super perspective around some really old pension requirements and, and those types of things. But I think the only other thing to sort of highlight is that the caps for superannuation contributions, as we alluded to before, go up from $25,000 as a deductible contribution to 27 and a half from 1 July and your non-concessional go up from 100000 to 110000 um, from 1 July as well. I think there's some other indexation, Rebecca, around some of the other caps. What do we have there? Yeah, the total super balance caps has increased from 1.6 to 1.7 million, which is, that that's the balance that a member can have and still be eligible for concessional taxation. And from 1st of July, um, the pen, minimum pension calculations will go to normal. So during the COVID period and up until now, if you were receiving a pension from your super fund, you could elect to um, apply 50% reduction on the minimum amount that was calculated, that reduction is going to go away from 1st of July. That could be a bit of a sleeper issue, couldn't it? Because if people have to sell shares or sell assets to be able to pay out their pension, then that could be forcing them to realise some losses or something or other in the environment. That's right. I personally feel that this is probably a little bit too early. I would have liked yeah. to have seen this um, reduction stay around for another 12 months. I mean, it's it's an option for a reduction. If you need to take more, you always could take more. This was just the minimum position. Now, obviously, much of this budget has been positioned as a budget for women. Obviously, the government needed to build some credits in, in, in that regard. Obviously, I've got two women on the call with me. So what do you guys think or, or, or what, what was in there that, that is appealing, I suppose? And I might start with you, Jackie, if you don't mind. I know we've written, or Rebecca, you've written a blog specifically summarising what's in the budget for women. But Jackie, what's your take on the budget from a women perspective? Yes, I think I'm not too excited about some of the tax cuts for, for women in this budget because to me, I think Rebecca mentions that, you know, quite, quite rightly in her blog is that they're actually family issues or Australian participation issues rather than just specific female issues. 
What I'm really um, happy about to see is some of the spending that the Australian government is going to do in relation to, you know, female issues around, you know, mental health and pregnancy and pregnancy loss. Um, you know, a lot of the additional funding around domestic violence and mental health and just mental health in, in an overall perspective, I think, was some of the things I got. I was really happy to see because I think it sees us moving in the right direction. Um, the, the couple of things that they're saying around, you know, tax cuts or that are going to help women from a, from a tax perspective wasn't what really got me excited. What about you, Rebecca? Oh, the, yeah, the, the tax cuts for women were not a thing in the budget, not really. Um, even the cheaper childcare um, and those items that were targeted towards women, they're family issues and they shouldn't be identified solely at helping women. Um, the, the superannuation boost, which was also included in, in um, trying to help increase women, uh, help women increase their super balances, an extra a few dollars if you're earning $450 a month is not going to help your superannuation balance. What would have been really nice is superannuation on paid parental leave. That would have helped and things like that. And um, the reason why that's important is because there's such a disparity at the balances that women are retiring compared to men. And that's because we take bigger breaks potentially from um, revenue generation during our lives, whether it's, you know, self-employed or working for someone else. We're still um, stepping back into that domestic role a lot more than our male count counterparts. And we should be allowed to do that, but still retire in the same way. And generally that's it's going to become an everyone issue, isn't it? Like if people took the $10,000 amounts out of their superannuation and now their super is down, everyone's going to need an opportunity to put more into super at some stage during their life. So hopefully those thresholds for super contributions will increase um, down the track. Um, there was one one um, initiative in there, which I was really interested in. Again, I don't think this is a women-specific one. I think it's a family-specific one. And that's the ability, um, I think they called it the family home guarantee, where it can help a single parent who has dependent, um, has dependent children, I think it is, um, the ability for them to buy a home with only a 2% deposit. Now, I flagged that because that'll be of interest to many of our real estate agents on there, but I think I, I like that concept of enabling some people with a lower deposit to be able to get into the property market. Do you agree, Jackie? Do you think that's a good initiative? Yeah, hands down, I do. Because, I mean, if anyone who's been through, had clients or been through a divorce situation personally, you know sometimes it's not the capacity to repay a loan. It's the ability to mount that deposit if you've had to split assets. Um, so I, do, I, I, I welcome this decision. And, um, yeah, I hope that there is some good take up on it for for both men and women who have been through a family separation situation. It's a start, isn't it? So obviously they're throwing some money at things. It'll be interesting to see how that money is used, whether it delivers on what they're, what they're saying they're trying to, to, to deliver with that. One of the most important parts about that measure is it actually doesn't only apply to first home buyers, which yeah. is really important to know and understand that even if you have owned a home before and you've gone through the situation, you can still access this. Yeah, good. Now, often with these budgets, it's what's not included that I find really interesting because I know as accountants, we have these things that um, clients have headaches over, we have headaches over, just are inefficient by way of a tax collection system and those types of things. What would you have, and I might start with you, Jackie, if you don't mind, what would you like to have seen in there and, and addressed within the budget this year? Whilst I think last night when I was watching the budget, I took a massive sigh of relief in there that we weren't going to have to be dealing with Division 7A, which is, you know, private <laughs> private um, loans to um, shareholders and associates for private companies. Because I just don't think that as, you know, businesses or as practitioners, we needed any more headaches pre-30 June. Um, the budget was silent on those Div 7A report reforms, um, which we had previously been... announced some reforms there, Jackie, haven't they? That's right. Yeah. So Treasury had consultation paper back in October 2018 that uh, I think it was the 2020 budget or the, no, it was the, the 19 budget that extended the start date to 2021. Um, no legislation on that yet. No sort of real commentary on where those Treasury recommendations or the consultation paper has landed. Yeah. Um, so what that does for clients and practitioners is it creates a little bit of uncertainty because some of those rules were, you know, whilst extending the loan period from seven to 10 years, the interest rate on those loans was quite, was quite high. It was about 3% per 
higher than the current benchmark interest rate, um, which is kind of really, you know, it seems like Treasury is trying to take a position that they want to punish, you know, people from extracting profits from a business from a loan when we're in a low interest environment. So yeah. some of those things I think um, would have been nice to have a bit of comfort, but I'm, I'm glad for not the extra work. Rebecca, any things you didn't see in there that you would have liked to have seen in there? I didn't really expect it, but there was a lot of talk in the lead up that there might be some easing on fringe benefits tax um, and changes to that regime, particularly in the support of the hospitality industry by, you know, dialing back on how much FBT and the circumstances you have to pay FBT for entertainment. I didn't honestly expect it, though. I mean, it's too much of a moneymaker, right? Yeah. Oh, look, I've got a few gripes because I think there's a few things that are fundamentally affecting the efficiency of the economy at the moment. And one of those is this whole gig economy and micro business sort of economy at the moment. There's so much confusion around contractors and how they need to be treated with, um, for tax purposes, whether they need to be deemed employees for IR reasons or for super reasons or for tax reasons. And I know it's a hard one to solve, but these contractors, these gig economies, if we could provide certainty, I think business would engage with more contractors where we share the rewards on an incremental basis. So if employers don't have to commit to permanent employees and all the risk that goes along with that, I think you know, we would hire a lot of contractors out there and help get more money flowing and, and, and grow on an incremental basis. Um, I, and that probably ties in a little bit to... I don't think enough's been done to find the resources to do the work. Now, this is probably not a financial or budget thing, really, is it? It's really we need the borders open so we can get the students back and the backpackers back because, as I said before, we've got clients left, right and centre who are just saying they just can't get people um, to do the work that they, that they need done. Anything else from you guys that you would have liked to have seen in there? Um, I would actually like to see, which is totally out of the blue, a, an alignment of payroll tax across all the states and just some, just some consistency because nobody ever has any idea what's going on. And, and businesses, until we actually get involved and look at it and have that time, can often not realise that they're actually um, liable for payroll tax in multiple places. They just don't consider yeah. it. It's just yeah. far too confusing at the moment. Even if they just aligned it, it would be a start. Maybe yes, they can increase the GST, get rid of payroll tax. I think I'd be up for that any day of the week. Yeah. I also liked a lot of the media gave a lot of attention to the idea of a standard personal deduction to eliminate the need for some individual tax returns to be lodged. I, reckon, I actually reckon that was a good idea as well. I don't know whether it had to be $3,000 or $1,000 or something, but I reckon you could get a lot of efficiency by just cutting a lot of individual tax return requirements out um, yeah. by doing that. And I think the government had previously announced that they were going to bring that in and then it got abandoned, you know. Yeah, ago, but yeah. couldn't get it through. Okay, ladies, as we wrap it up, um, any parting comments on the budget overall feel? Maybe we should give it a score out of 10. What do you reckon? Do you want to start, Rebecca? Uh, six. Six? Yeah. Any comments or any parting comments on the budget? I Look, it's, it touched everything a little bit but there were a lot of things in the budget that we already knew about and a lot of the things, particularly for women, a lot of those measures that will mean something don't actually translate into a monetary event for us and hopefully the spending that they actually put together ends up in the right place and we have future um, change. But other than that, I've, I'm not feeling very inspired. Jackie? Yeah, I'd probably give it a, a seven in terms of spend, like, you know, infrastructure and some of the resources, some really good measures around health and, and education and those types of things that we really want to see more of and trying to get more funds back into the economy. But from a tax reform perspective, you know, which is what I get passionate about, I'd probably give it a five. Oh, you guys are harsh. <laughs> see, I reckon I, I, reckon I, I give it a nine. Not from a tax reform perspective, but I think I think we underestimate the tax reform that's been done by changing the tax rates that have already been legislated. So the idea that tax rate, the thresholds for personal tax and company tax rate has come down, I think that is actually fundamental reform of the tax system because it changes the way people use structures and different things like that um, and, with, and with tax planning. Um, I mean, I still think there's always, there's always improvements to be made. 
But I actually reckon we underestimate the benefit we're going to get from that. And so I give it a nine because I think spending is what we need at the moment. Um, and we need it out there. We need it going. I'm just worried about how we're going to get the, how everyone's going to get the staff to do the work that, that we're going to create um, from all this spending. Because from what I hear, there's not many of them out there that want to do those jobs. Guys, of course, um, we're, we're now 12th of May. After budget is always the start of tax planning time. So now that we know there's anything, there's nothing new or nothing too new out there that we need to worry about before 30 June. Of course, now's the time to get into tax planning between now and 30 June. There's a stack of work to be done um, in that regard, planning to 30 June to make sure you're not paying a dollar more than you have to. So um, if you're a client of Business Depot, I'm sure you'll hear from us shortly to get some of that started. Um, otherwise, if you need some help with that yourself, please don't hesitate to reach out to us either at 1300 B Depot. Check us out on the website, businessdepot.com.au. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website. A link will be sent out to you shortly as well. Our next event, we're popping back to um, one of our financial planning events. Um, we call them our What They Didn't Teach You about at school and the next one is on personal insurances so we're talking life tpd key, key man income protection insurances so we've got mitch hood from our brisbane um, financial planning team and simone from our sydney financial planning team talking about insurances how much insurance do you need why do you need it how do you make claims um, everything you need to know in that regard thank you very much cheers ladies thanks thanks john thanks Rebecca.